Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast. Today we're discussing the latest trends and research in medicine with Dr. Kirsten Bivens Domingo from her vantage point as Editor-in-Chief of JAMA and the JAMA Network in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Welcome back, Dr. Bivens Domingo. Pleasure to be here. Well, we uh, last talked to you in September uh, when you were just settling into your new role. And uh, lo and behold, a couple of months later, we've got ourselves a triple-demic uh, with early surges of the flu, uh, RSV, and of course, we're still fighting COVID. Uh, from your perspective as both a clinician and a researcher, you know, what do we expect in the months ahead and how should physicians be preparing for it? Right. Uh, I think this is hitting all of us uh, hard. It's hitting every age demographic hard. It is really putting a strain on our hospital systems. RSV and flu are things that we're used to dealing with at this time of the year. But the fact of all of the, the protections we had in place for the last two years in the pandemic meant we probably have didn't see the full brunt of these. And so we are seeing them now. Our hospitals are full and it looks like there will be an uptick in, in COVID cases as well. And so uh, I, I think those people who follow the epidemiology of infections uh, are not surprised, but I think it's hit all of us how how early in the season the numbers are high, how quickly they filled up hospitals in many parts, especially for RSV. It's really quite striking. Um, and uh, and then we probably haven't, we're just at the tip of seeing the beginning of, of, of uh, the, the COVID surges. I mean, this is a time to remind everybody, of course, that um, vaccinations work and it turns out we have good vaccines for uh, for influenza and for COVID-19. We have a lot of people in the country vaccinated, but we have very uh, a really uh, strikingly small number of people who've gotten the boosters. Um, and uh, what I am particularly concerned about, and when I talk to my colleagues, it is about making sure that those, especially when we talk about the adult population, those who are most vulnerable to illness are, are getting those protective preventive measures in place. So in addition to dealing with uh, the current situation of this kind of triple-demic, we're still uh, dealing with the after effects of our uh, our COVID situation, particularly in the realm of long COVID. And I know oh, yes. uh, this is kind of front and center uh, on JAMA's homepage in the Editor's Choice arena. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you're learning on the research side mm -hmm. uh, about the global burden of long COVID. What's, uh, what is the latest study about and, and what would you like to feature there? Sure. I, I think that uh, JAMA published a, a, a large study uh, from uh, the Global Burden of Disease Investigators really highlighting uh, the burden of long COVID around the world using clusters of symptoms to define uh, the, the pattern that is emerging as long COVID. And what it suggests is that the burden is quite high. Um, I think the estimates vary. And part of the reason the estimates vary is because our definitions of long COVID vary. Um, for me, as a scientist, there are so many interesting things emerging about the patterns of symptoms that make up long COVID. What is the underlying pathophysiology? How do we get there? Why do we get this symptom cluster? How do common symptoms like fatigue vary across conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome versus long COVID. So there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn on the definition side, and the NIH is very interested in what the exact definition is going to be, how we might have some markers that tell us exactly which patients have long COVID. But I would say as a clinician, what's what uh, while I appreciate the science, I'm thrilled the NIH and the the, uh, the federal government has put money into long COVID. The challenge is we have patients suffering right now, um, and I think we have to be able to uh, to address the needs of patients right now. Again, before we know all the information, before we know exactly how to make a definitive diagnosis, but really to be mindful that. It is common for people to have sequelae of uh, of uh, COVID infection, and that as clinicians we have to keep an eye on that, even as the science is emerging for exactly what set of markers tell us this is really long COVID. And I, I think that's the challenge. It's been our challenge throughout the pandemic. Physicians still need to act even when we don't have the perfect science. 
And you're speaking of uh, that kind of investment in the research. You did have a recent conversation with the Assistant Secretary uh, for Health in the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Rachel Levine. And uh, you talked about two major federal reports uh, that investigated long COVID and the government's response to it. What were the key takeaways there? Right. So I, I think what was impressive in these two reports is uh, how comprehensive they are. And so if you look, just one report really focused on the science um, and it really uh, began with understanding the underlying pathophysiology, understanding the mechanisms that lead to the set of symptoms, thinking very clearly about what the definitions are for these symptoms that make up uh, the diagnosis of long COVID, thinking through uh, the tr the epidemiology, the treatment course, what treatments might be available, as well as the overall societal impact, the, the cost, the cost uh, of this, this longer term sequelae of, of this pandemic, which incidentally isn't ending. And so uh, I, I think that that is a real challenge. Uh, so that that was a it, it's a major initiative, clearly, of the federal government. But the way that they're going to achieve these scientific goals are really in partnerships with others who are also trying to to um, fund the best science. Um, it, we, we sort of have to build these studies fairly quickly, not just start from scratch. And so trying to take advantage of studies that are ongoing to do more longer term follow up. What I loved about the second report and was really interesting is that the second report really said there are people with disabilities now. There are people who are suffering now. And what can we do on the um, defining what a disability is, making sure people have access through insurance coverage and other types of things? That I think it's admirable that these reports are side to side. I think seeing out how it plays out in for actual patients is is the devil's in the detail there, but I think it's nice to have the twin initiatives really laid out uh, at the federal level in the way it was. And that is so important, as you said, people are, are suffering from this right now, and it must be frustrating uh, to be in that situation where, you know, the terminology, diagnoses, things like that are just not yet defined. Exactly. And if you are, if you are a, a patient, you know, so, so what does that mean? If I have th this burden of symptoms that I really cannot, cannot return to work, what, what does that mean? And what does that mean to an employer? What does it mean to a healthcare organization? Um, and I, I do think we have to figure out how to, how to move forward now while we're also still learning, but but the devil's in the details and it, it isn't without its challenges. There is a strong equity component to this as well, because we certainly know that at, at the height of the, the earliest phases of the pandemic, in particular, um, communities of color, um, communities with less resources had the highest burden of, of COVID. That's shifted over time. There's been a lot more exposure over time, but certainly uh, those communities that have the least resources will be also affected by long COVID uh, in, a, in an important way that, that attention to how we make sure everyone gets care uh, has to be attended to. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we talked about in our last conversation, uh, you said something interesting, which is that you and everybody at JAMA are in the business of communication. And you recently interviewed Dr. Fauci about how to communicate with the public in what has got to be a really changed landscape uh, where we've just seen you know, a torrent of misinformation. What, what advice would you give to physicians about how they also can be in the business of communication. Yeah, that's it's a really good one. I mean, it was such an honor to to talk with uh, with Dr. Fauci, who really has been a, a leader uh, in in the pandemic, and who even as he steps down from his leadership roles, uh, will continue to have a role in communicating. I think the thing that I was struck in that conversation was him really encouraging uh, those of us, whether we're scientists, whether we're taking care of patients, um, whether we work in roles where communication is part of our roles, is to be persistent in, um, in what the science is telling us and to be clear on that. And he really, you know, he talked a lot about how physicians who are speaking in environments where there is less receptivity about vaccines, where there might be um, 
disinformation or misinformation about therapeutics that, as JAMA published this month, have shown not to be effective, like ivermectin. Uh, that how how can um, how can we persist even in the face of a lot of skepticism, doubt, and active hostility, frankly. And he was very clear. He says, we have to just keep going out there and talking about it. And I do, I I, I did love the simplicity of the way he said it, that, um, that, you know, we just have to keep pushing forward. You know, the science tells us what we have to do to, to keep healthy. We have to, we have to keep talking about it with our patients, with our community, the people we talk to in a day-to-day basis. And, uh, and I, I thought it was quite compelling. How do you see the role of journals like JAMA changing in the face of this situation where maybe just kind of being persistent, continuing to kind of give the facts doesn't work on some people? How do you how do you factor that into your role as an editor in chief? Yeah, I, I I think there there's the reality is um, people consume information best when you're meeting them where they are. They're more likely to be receptive if um, you know if if they're consuming information on a platform they're used to consuming information from and see other sources. So. I think it is important that JAMA continues to publish its print pages as we do now, to have the digital, the traditional journal, the way it looks. But part of the reason we've really invested in multimedia is because we know, for example, that people do get a lot of their information from platforms like YouTube, and that there are a lot of people who create really compelling content on on YouTube that is compelling, it's easy to understand, it's informative. And um, certainly one very clear way to combat um, misinformation, certainly, and even disinformation, which has a more strategic component, is to make sure that the platforms that uh, make uh, information available also include information from us um, that is is easy to understand, that conveys the point simply, that is accessible. And I think we are doing more of that, and we'll, you'll continue to see us doing more of that. Well, this last question beyond what we've talked about already in the triple demic topics, um, any other kind of key uh, things that should be on physicians' radar right now? Well, um, I, you know, we're headed into the winter, um, uh, and uh, I think um, we are stretching an already stretched, uh, um, you know, workforce. That is, people who are in healthcare. We're in year three of the pandemic. There's a lot of talk about burnout. There's a lot of talk about. Um, the challenges that we all have in day to day. I spent all of yesterday talking with my colleagues at UCSF about, um, you know, the checklist in the electronic health record. And, uh, you know, we are talking about, we are all fatigued, no matter what job we do during the day, we're all tired of being in year three of the pandemic. But I think um, people who are on the front line of taking care of patients uh, have been doing it for a long time. And I, I do think um, it, it, it is the time to continue to shine a light on that for organizations for uh, to, uh, to play a role in saying, no, this really is not sustainable. We have to have other interventions. Um, and I do think whether it is the people who are studying how we make use of electronic health records in a more streamlined fashion, how we organize our systems of care, how we think about reimbursement and other things. All of those things are the essential building blocks, the data that we need, the science that we need to really improve, I think, how clinicians uh, um, uh, take care of patients. And uh, we want to be in a position to to continue to um, uh, accelerate some of those conversations. Absolutely. Dr. Bibbins Domingo, it is a pleasure to uh, catch up with you. And we'll check back in in a couple months about uh, what's latest in the research front. That wraps up today's episode. We'll be back soon with another episode. In the meantime, you can find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care. 